we explained in the first hour uh, something that uh, is not widely known with regard to the household salvation and the eating of the lamb as is pictured in the Passover. Uh, and uh, I think that it's more vividly pictured there than perhaps anywhere else, uh, though there are other uh, um, illustrations that are good. But uh, the household salvation involves the blood of the lamb applied, and it has to do with the handing down of the original sin, coming through the Father and you are saved in your association with the house of your father where the blood is applied. The eating of the Passover lamb has to do with capacity and is a reference to the need for more or less of the life of the lamb uh, for your uh, ongoing life and existence. And it, it addresses the old sin nature and the fact that some sinned more than others, some needed a, a greater work of Christ on the cross in these areas than, uh, than others uh, did. All, of course, were equal in the original sin. Uh, but then you had um, what's known as well the count for the lamb, and we're going to get into that in just a little bit. But before we do, we're talking about Christ going to a certain house that was furnished and prepared for a Passover Seder, not just for the Passover itself, but actually for a Seder. Uh, and it had uh, s uh, certain uh, specifications, certain requirements. And one of the most outstanding things, and perhaps you, you know, you've often read this verse where they were to follow a guy with a pitcher of water to a certain house. Now, what significance could that have? Well, it lets us know that Christ was setting up for a Seder. Uh, though it's not exactly like the Seders we have uh, today, it was an ordered meal that included set times for washing. Now, one of the things that he washed uh, and uh, gives us further insight as to this were feet. Uh, the hands were not only to be washed, but in John chapter 13, feet were also to be washed. Now, Jesus Christ himself set this up. In the original Passover, you were to eat it standing up with your staff in your hand, your loins girded, and your shoes on your feet. But now the Lord Jesus Christ, according to the new covenant, is also going to have not just hands washed, but feet washed. Why? Well, how beautiful are the feet of them to preach the gospel of peace. The original gospel of peace is that of the new covenant to the world. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. What gospel? Gospel of the kingdom? The gospel of peace. Because the prince of peace is going to establish his kingdom. And those that go from the Passover to proclaim this not only have to have pure hands and a clean heart, but they also have to have what? Washed feet. Uh, because they are God's emissaries, his servants, to proclaim the gospel. So note in verse number one, before the feast of Passover. Now, Jesus Christ just ate the Passover. What does that mean? Well, under normal circumstances, the Jews ate the Passover beginning the night of the 15th. But because Christ was going to do something unusual, he ate it a few hours early. He ate it before the three o'clock hour on, this, on that day when the Passover lamb was killed. And the reason that he did that is it was sanctioned by the, uh, the rabbis and, and, and obviously sanctioned by God. Uh, sometimes you had to eat it at various times in Jerusalem uh, according to, to schedule. So Jesus Christ ate it early. He ate it beginning at 6 o'clock on the 14th, the day of Passover, prior to 3 o'clock the afternoon when he was killed and the original Passover lamb was killed. Okay, Jesus knew that his hour would come, that he should depart out of the world. The supper, verse number 2, being ended. This is the Passover Seder. The devil now put it in the heart of Judas Iscariot to betray him. Now let's... Uh, drop down to verse number four. Jesus did something unusual. Here he is in this house, and it says, he arose from supper, it was ended, meaning that he pretty much went through the order of the Seder. So you have the washing of hands here, but now he's going to do something different. He rose and uh, laid aside his, his garments, his outer robe. Now, note this. 
How do we know it's part of the Passover Seder? Because every Seder had a side table wherein you had towels. You had a basin for water, a pitcher of water, and a pitcher for the four cups of, of wine. Jesus Christ had that there. He went to the side table, he got up, he went to the side table, and he took a towel. Then it says, he poured water into a basin. What is this? It's part of the Passover Seder that we have talked about today. It was in, in existence in that room. That, that was part of the furnishings and the preparation, that this would be uh, there ahead of time for them to use. And began to wash the disciples' feet and wiped them with the towel wherewith he was girded. And of course, there was some discussion there with the, the Apostle Peter uh, on, you're never going to wash my feet, Lord. And Jesus said in verse 8, If I don't wash you, you have no part of me, not only my feet, Lord, but my hands and my head. Jesus said, wait one second, all right? He that is washed doesn't need uh, to wash except for his feet. You're clean, but not all. Of course, he was referring to, to Judas Iscariot. And the, the idea of foot washing comes, number one, he was showing them that in order to be great, in, in spiritual realities, you have to be humble and willing to do the small jobs. Like what? Being a servant and washing someone else's feet. But then secondly, in order to be a representative of God, you not only had to have a clean body and a clean head and hands, your feet had to be clean. You're going to do some walking for the Lord. In, in just a couple of days, he's going to say, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. You've got to have clean feet uh, to do that. So from this portion of scripture, we find that that furnished and prepared house had everything necessary or, or part of the things necessary for a Seder today. We'll see some other things here in a moment. Okay, if you will come back with me to Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. Now, we're on the third point in our outline of Jesus Christ and the Passover Seder, and we're going to talk about a minyan. A minyan means a contingent. And the rabbis had it where? If you're going to come to Jerusalem, you have to have uh, no more uh, than 20, but at least 10. 10 was the minimum, 20 was the maximum. People to eat the Passover. If you had less than 10, you had to join with a house that would bring your number above 10, but you couldn't have more uh, than, than 20. And uh, again, we look to the Word of God where it talks about that. In verse number 4 of chapter 12, If the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of souls. Every man according to his eating shall you make your count for the lamb. And that's where we get our, our phrase here. There had to be a minyan. And the reason being is God didn't want the lamb wasted. And we, do, uh, we too do not believe that the death of the Lord Jesus Christ was in vain. Where sin abounded, grace abounded more, that's for sure. But it incorporated every sin, every ramification of sin, every consequence of sin, any ripple effect of sin, and, and so forth. And so the lamb could not be wasted. God wanted it all consumed or the remaining part burnt. But the burnt part was more or less uh, uh, just simply in vain. It just goes uh, up in flames. So therefore God said, wait, instead of wasting the meat of the lamb... I want you to make a count so that it is utilized, it is consumed. And of course, it reflects back to the Lord Jesus Christ, where everything that Christ did on the cross of Calvary uh, can be utilized and is a provision for the sins of the world and for their salvation. Now, again, we find this in verse number four. The household be too little, let him go to his neighbor and, um, and take a lamb so that both houses could apply the blood, and both houses could share in um, the, uh, the meat. 
Here, again, for Israel. One, household salvation. Two, it's a theocracy, national salvation. Everybody that came up out of Egypt was somebody that was under the blood. Everybody that came up out of Egypt was saved through household salvation. Everybody that came up out of Egypt came up because they ate a portion of the lamb. Everybody that came up out of Egypt uh, came out of Egypt dressed the very same way. And everyone, as to their body, at least for, the, for that time, was eating unleavened bread, which is a symbol of evil and corruption, uh, leaven is. And they were eating unleavened bread. So it, it pictures the Christian way of life. Passover, salvation. It's totally separate from the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which indicates sanctification or the ongoing Christian way of life. Two separate things, but they're connected. Once you're saved, how long does God want you to wait before you start serving him? A day, two days, a week, a year? No. The picture is, once you partake of the Passover lamb, you're ready to go the very next day. God says go, and you are unleavened. You're in a state where you can walk the walk and talk the talk and be pleasing to the Lord. And that is the picture that is made here. Okay, now what about Christ? Did he understand this particular minion law? Uh, you had to go to the rabbinical court. You had to, to, to register and, uh, and uh, have at least 10 people. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 26. Matthew 26 and verse number 20. Now when the even was come, he sat down with the twelve. And this, of course, was in conjunction with verse 19, Passover having been made ready for him. So the question is, uh, did Christ have enough for a minion? And the answer is absolutely. How many disciples did he have? Twelve. He sat down with them. Twelve plus one is thirteen people. So he had the count for the lamb. Now, of course, um, I don't know how much he ate or how much the, the others uh, ate, uh, every, every man according to his uh, eating. But a count was made for the lamb so that he had enough for one house where he was to go and, uh, and meet there again so the lamb would not be wasted and that it would be shared across the board. Household salvation, national salvation, we're all in this together. And it all focused and centered around the Passover. Okay, while we're here, let's move on to our next point. Point number four. We know that Jesus Christ eight in Seder uh, format because of how he ate the meal. Oh, well, pastor, that's, that's easy. We've all seen the pictures of the Last Supper, you know, where Jesus is there and there's this big long table and everybody's sitting at it. The problem is, is with regard to the chairs because uh, didn't have folding chairs back then but what they used were recliners. He both ate sitting up and lying down. He ate uh, sitting up because when you ate the food that symbolized slavery, the marar, the bitter herbs, you sat up because this indicates you're being a servant. You know, Johnny on the spot, ready to go, uh, quick when you're called and, and the like. But you eat it in conjunction with the bitter herbs. That's no way to live when you're a servant all the time. Okay, but when you, you are now part of the royal family of God, called out of the bondage of Egypt, you're no longer their slaves. You're headed to the promised land, and you're made part of the family of God. You're now royalty. When royalty eats, how do they eat? Lying down. Somebody serves them. And so, when you ate unleavened bread, foods that symbolized royalty rather than slavery, you ate it lying down. And Jesus Christ uh, uh, sat on the, on the uh, front of 
of the recliner at times, and he uh, would lay down at times, depending on the food that was served. All right, again, the verse we just read. And when the even was come, he did what with the twelve? Sat down. The meal started off with your sitting, symbolizing that uh, before uh, you were um, set free, liberated from Egypt, you were their slaves, Israel. But now let's go to John chapter 13. John chapter 13. Verse 18. I speak not of you all, I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture might be fulfilled, he that eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. Now I tell you before it come to pass, that when it has come to pass, you might believe that I am he. All of the things that he did here were things that they were familiar with. But to have him reinterpret some of these symbols as being him and the new covenant was different. And so therefore, the reason that he ate Passover ahead of time was to let them know before he died the significance of it all. They, they couldn't fathom it at the time, but after he died, it was brought to their remembrance, and they said, hey, yeah, he told us about this. He told us this would happen. So anyway, now I tell you before it comes to pass, verse 19. He that receives whomsoever I send receives me. He that receives me receives him that sent me. Jesus had thus said he was troubled in spirit, and then he said, verily I say to you, one of you are going to betray me. Now, Remember the Apostle Paul and the Lord's table. What did he say with regard to this? I received of the Lord that which I delivered unto you on the same night that he was what? Betrayed. He took bread and took the cup. The Lord's table has its roots in the Passover, and on that very night, the same night he was betrayed, he took bread. So if we're going to celebrate the Lord's uh, table, we've got to think back of the night when he celebrated his last Passover called his supper uh, in in which he took these elements and made them something else. Okay. The disciples looked one on another, doubting of whom he spake. Now, these verses are going to let us know that Jesus Christ was now lying down in Greek and Roman royal fashion, eating, eating. You all see the pictures of somebody eating and they're holding up the grapes and they're letting them fall in their mouth and so forth. It's a very similar fashion. He was, excuse the phrase, laid back at this point. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter therefore beckoned him that he should ask who it should be uh, of whom he spoke. And then lying on Jesus' breast, that, that's exactly the way it was. All of these recliners were close by so that he could just simply tip over and, and be uh, on, on the Lord's breast, as it were. It indicates that he was lying down, and that's how it should be uh, pictured. They both sat and were lying down at different times. Said, uh, Lord, who is it? It is he to whom I shall give a sop. And when he dipped it, he dipped the sop and gave it to Judas Iscariot. Okay, something else with the regard to this. We immediately see that he did something else. They do it at Passover Seder. What is that? Dip bread, and of course not lamb nowadays, but he dipped bread and lamb into the bitter herbs, into the, to the gravy there, and handed it to him. The dipping aspect is part of the Seder, and that's how they ate their Passover meal, and that's what the Seder is today. So, um, as we're looking at this, the table was set, dishes that had never touched leaven, you had a side table with all the uh, accoutrements that accompanied the the, uh, uh, Passover meal, and we know that it was a Seder because even today, In part of the Seder meal, when it comes to certain foods implying slavery, you sat up. And then certain foods that implied freedom, 
you lay down. And of course, the unleavened bread was freedom, the bitter herbs was slavery. So they would both sit and, and uh, lie, sit and lie through the service. All right? Let's go back to Leviticus 23. Leviticus chapter 23. Now, uh, this 666 is coincidental. It is not meant as anything other than 6 p.m., 6 a.m., 6 p.m., and this is all one day, the 14th. The original Passover was killed on the afternoon of the 14th at 3 o'clock. It was uh, cooked, and they began eating at 6 o'clock on Thursday. At midnight on Thursday the 15th, the death angel came and killed the Egyptians, and they were out of there by 6 o'clock in the morning, and they left in haste. But Jesus Christ ate his Passover meal at 6 o'clock uh, on the day of Passover itself. Again, this was allowed and sanctioned. Obviously, we, uh, Christ didn't commit a sin, and this is exactly what he did. But he did so for a specific reason because he wanted to inform his disciples about a change in the Passover and the fulfillment of the antitype. This, this Passover stuff here, now it's me. It used to be a feast of the old covenant, now it's a feast of the new covenant. And this is what's going to happen. I'm going to be betrayed, handed over to, to the, uh, to the uh, Sanhedrin. They're going to hand me over to the Gentiles, and they're going to crucify me. But it's all in the plan of God to provide the Passover lamb for the new covenant. And so it started at 6 o'clock on, on Wednesday night. But the important thing is that it, it happened at evening. Leviticus chapter 23. Let's... Um, Look at verse number five. The first of the feasts of the Lord. In the fourteenth day of the first month at evening, at even is the Lord's Passover. And we're in chapter twenty-three. Look at verse thirty-two. And it shall be to you a Sabbath of rest. You afflict your souls. The ninth day of this month at even. Now here's how you were to celebrate. The days. Jews started their days at six o'clock in the evening. From even to even, you shall celebrate your Sabbath. So from six o'clock here to six o'clock there is when uh, uh, the Passover was, and the Lord ate it on the day of Passover ahead of time. We know to John 13, 1, before the Passover. It meant before the Passover lamb was killed here, he was eating it at 6 o'clock that night. But he still was in keeping with the Scripture because Passover was to be eaten in the evening. Now, some of the spiritual implications. Um, the night cometh when no man can do what? Work. Uh, all of the work of salvation, therefore, is seen in what? The Passover lamb. You, man, especially at that time, couldn't do very much at night. They had to wait for the, for the light. And so Passover uh, uh, was indicative of the helplessness of man. Also, because it was done at night, it was indicative of the sinfulness of man. Uh, time and again, darkness is a picture of sin and, and of evil and uh, of uh, the, way things, uh, the way man does things apart from God and trying to hide them. So when, when man's sin was darkest, God provided the light in the Passover lamb. Therefore, Passover had to be eaten in the evening when it was dark. Okay, let's go then to uh, Luke. Let's go to Luke. Chapter 22. Luke chapter 22.
And it says here, and when the hour was come, he sat down and the 12 apostles with him. All right. Luke brings us to the exact hour that the day of Passover started. He did not eat it on the 13th. It was prepared on the 13th. It was killed and cooked on the 13th for him. The room was prepared. He entered into the room, but he didn't start the Passover feast until when? Six o'clock, right? Right at the precise hour. God's timing is important. Uh, the reason is, uh, you, you, you have to have the Passover lamb killed at, at this time, and Jesus Christ waited, in keeping with that, waited till the hour of the evening. All right, come back with me to Mark 14. And verse number 17, note again. In the evening he came with the twelve, after they had, verse 16, made ready the Passover. So the evening is uh, indicative of man's helplessness, man's sinfulness, uh, and um, uh, the a backdrop of the whole Passover ceremony. But it especially uh, indicated the point in when the, the Lord Jesus Christ himself would be betrayed. And then judgment. Turn to chapter 13 of John. Now, as we start here and before we read this scripture let me recount for you the things that happened during this night at six o'clock precisely when the hour came jesus as the host of the passover seder started the meal he went through step by step however many steps were included in his seder um, after he went through this, he established another tradition, as it were, with regard to the Passover Seder. The, Jew, the Orthodox Jews don't do it today because they don't think Christ is their Messiah. But he established it for true believing Orthodox Jews under law, foot washing. Today, liberal religion calls it Monday Thursday, um, where people get together and they wash uh, uh, their feet, or at least they go through the pretense of, of doing it and the like. But um, it is not for the church, which is the body of Christ. It wasn't established, and it wasn't established actually for, for unbelieving Orthodox Jews. It was for his 12 disciples. However, one of them was not all clean. And uh, during this time, as time is progressing here, he went out dur uh, during the night of the Passover. All of this is transpiring. He ate the meal. He established foot washing. He pointed out who Judas Iscariot uh, uh, would be the one betraying him. Judas went off to betray him. They sung a hymn after the meal was over. They went to the Garden of Gethsemane. He prayed three times. Judas came in the Garden of Gethsemane and betrayed him. He was taken then by this time it's around midnight and he had six trials. Uh, before um, before Annas, before Caiaphas, before Annas, before Pilate, before Herod, before Pilate. That brought us to about six o'clock in the morning. Finally, Pilate said, what do you want me to do with your, I'll release, I'll release one of these, Barabbas or Christ? Uh, Barabbas is a murderer, insurrection, surely you want him. No, they said crucify Christ. So he washed his hands, and by nine o'clock that morning, Christ was on the cross, and by three o'clock that afternoon, between the evenings when the lamb was killed, Jesus Christ died precisely according to the time. Now, all of that transpired. It, it seems like a just short time in the Bible, but all of that uh, uh, transpired in, in one day. Actually, it was a pretty short time. But let's go to chapter 13 here in John. And again, note the significance of the betrayal. Judas, being the coward that he was, uh, went secretly and went at night. After Christ gave the sop to Judas, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. 
No man at the table knew what intent he spake. Some of them thought that because uh, Judas had the bag, Jesus said to him that uh, buy those things that we had need of against the feast. I guess they were still hungry. And or that you should give something to the poor. But he then, having received the sop, went immediately out and it was night. The Passover had to be eaten at night. Jesus Christ was betrayed at night when, when uh, men uh, tried to cover their evil and sinfulness uh, at the time when he ate the Passover. It's against that backdrop. Well, let's go back to Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. And see again the, the symbolism. The night especially pictures judgment. Time when it's bleak for men that are not covered by the blood, not under the blood, not protected by the blood of the Lamb. Verse number 6. You'll keep it up, that is the Lamb, to the 14th day of the same month, and the whole congregation, the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it between the evenings. Um, okay, let's go to um, verse here, 20, 29. The night speaks of betrayal and judgment. And it shall come to pass that at midnight the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on the throne to the firstborn that was captive in the dungeon to the firstborn of all cattle. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, for there was a great cry in Egypt, and there was not one house where there was not one dead. Uh, also in verse number 42, it is a night to be much observed unto the Lord for bringing them out of the land of Egypt. This is that night of the Lord to be observed by Israel. So it was a night of judgment, a night of betrayal, a night that implied uh, the, the evil and sinfulness of man, a man trying to cover his deeds in the night, as uh, the scripture says. And that's when Jesus Christ ate the Passover in keeping with this ordinance. All right, let's go back now to Matthew. Matthew 26, and then we'll go to Luke. Now what we want to establish here, and we've already uh, shown you in John 13, is that there was a, a set order of things. in the Passover Seder. Certain things were done at certain times. As we've uh, looked at it, uh, you, you had your blessings, and then you did your dipping, then you did your hand washing, then you did your pouring, then you, you did other things. And there, there was a specific order of things, a way to do them. And we find that Jesus Christ followed such an order. In chapter number 26 of Matthew and verse number 23. And Jesus answered and said, he that dips his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. This indicates one of the aspects of the feast that at a certain time you would take the green vegetables and dip it in the marar, the bitter herbs. At certain times, uh, uh, you, would, uh, you would take the unleavened bread and dip it in the bitter herbs. At certain times, you would make a Hillel sandwich, which was in existence at the time of Christ. Uh, and the reason we know Christ made a Hillel sandwich is that's what the sop was. It was a choice morsel of that lamb wrapped, uh, as it were, in the unleavened bread, dipped in the gravy, and handed over to, to the honored guest. And by the way, that is another tradition that Christ established here. 
he gave to Judas, whom he called a friend. It was his friend who betrayed him, Judas Iscariot. And how do we know he was a friend and the honored guest at the Passover Seder? Not only did Jesus Christ wash his feet, he did it to the other 11. But he was the one who was handed the sop, the choice, juicy morsel of lamb that he got and, and, uh, and dipped it there with the, with the unleavened bread and handed it to him. And Judas evidently took it and ate it, and he ate it, and the devil entered into him uh, at that point because he was going to betray the Lord. That's all part of the Passover Seder. Set times for dipping. All right? Now, let's go to Luke 22. And in Luke, we, we really have a, the best, perhaps, uh, indication that the Lord followed a protocol when he ate the Passover, that his was indeed a Seder. Verse 14, the six o'clock hour came, the day of Passover uh, began to exist. It didn't start till six that night. He sat down in keeping a good Jewish fashion. That's how you started the meal because you were slaves in Egypt. So you're not going to eat the Passover without first of all remembering that that's why the Passover is in existence because you were a slave. So you sat down symbolizing you were a slave to the uh, Egyptians. He said unto them, with desire, I have desire to eat this Passover with you. He wanted to eat it with the disciples. Now there's a, a reason. Note, before I suffer, all of the things that he was now doing were predictions. He was establishing types for another antitype. The Passover lamb was the antitype of his, his crucifixion as the Passover. But also, the bread and the wine were indicative of his body and blood. That would They were now types of which the literal would be his body and blood upon the cross for the new covenant. That's why he ate it before rather than after. He was giving these both predictions and symbolisms. All right. Note what he says. I say to you, I will not eat any more thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Now, this he is not eating the afikomen here. He is eating at one of the steps in the Passover, the regular matzah, the regular unleavened bread. And that's why he says, I'm not going to eat of the Passover anymore. He didn't eat the afikomen yet. That's about to happen. And you'll remember, the afikomen, though broken ahead of time, is not eaten until after the Passover meal. And that's what he's going to do. He's going to take the afikomen, and he is going to break it, and it's the bread we eat. He had this Seder. All right, he said, I'm not going to eat the Passover anymore until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup. Well, you say, yeah, Pastor, this is the cup, uh, of course, um, that we eat. No, it was not. They already had the first cup. Now they were going to drink the second cup, the cup of judgment. He took the cup and he gave thanks. And he said, uh, 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 and take this and divide it amongst yourselves. This was the second cup that he took. And note the protocol. Remember, every time they took a cup and were ready to drink it in the Seder, what did they do? They blessed it. They poured it. They were about to take it. They blessed it. Then, then they drank it. It was the second cup. So we have a first cup. We have a second cup. We have the regular matzah eaten. But now we move into after supper, after the Passover is over. Uh, before we do that note, it, with regard to the, to the cup of the Passover, I will not drink the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. But now notice verses 19 and 20. What does Paul say with regard to us? In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he says, he took the bread and he took the cup after he supped. 
He had already eaten the Passover meal. This was something done uh, uh, after this. So he ate matzah and he drank wine. And then he and then he stopped right there and said, this is in relation to the Passover. I'm not going to eat of it anymore. But what did he do at this point? Verse 19, and he took bread. Note verse 20, likewise also the cup when after supper. The Lord's uh, Supper, as we know it, was established after the Passover. And what we're talking about here is the fact that he went through a Seder. He went through a protocol. He, he numbered certain things to be done at certain times. And after he was through eating the matzah, the, the meat, the bitter herbs, and drinking the second cup, he said, he said I'm not going to do it anymore in association with Passover. But then he took bread and cup and did something else. Note verse 19. He took bread. Now, this is called the bread of affliction in the Seder. Or, um, and you saw the, uh, the cute little uh, uh, Hebrew pastor there. Uh, I, I, I liked him uh, too. Uh, well, why, why do you want the copy? He says, when you have the real thing, take the real thing. He uh, no uh, lack of enthusiasm uh, for it. Uh, but uh, they were discussing how the Greek word, afikomen, I have come, all of a sudden got in, in a Jewish meal. Well, um, originally, I believe that it got in there because Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacob were the three uh, 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 patriarchs, and the middle matzah indicated Isaac. But now we look at it, and we can see the middle matzah indicates Jesus Christ, who was broken. How do we know? He took that and said, okay, now, before this all happened, you break the afikoman and you hide it and you redeem it and, and bring it back, you un, unwrap it. And that's what he was doing. He took the afikoman and gave thanks, break it further and gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. So he took the unleavened bread, but it wasn't just an ordinary matzah. It was the afikoman, the bread of affliction. And he said, it, it's, it's broken. But here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to break it further. Uh, it's broken for you. I'm going to break it further into little pieces, and I want you all to eat it. And uh, verse 20, this is where we'll take up tonight. Likewise, also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. We already saw where he drank the second cup of judgment, but now he brings us to the third cup of redemption, lifts it up, and says, This is now my blood. The whole point is we have Hebraic roots and uh, we celebrate the Lord's Supper and we can't do so without thinking of the Passover and we can't think of the Passover without thinking of the um, terrible cost that Jesus Christ paid.